Good evening. The end of the year workshop meeting executive session of the Methuen School Committee, posted for Monday, June 27, 2022, at 5 p.m. We'll now come to order. Madam Secretary, will you please call the roll? Rachel Banks. Present. Ryan DeZaglio. Laurie Keegan. Present. Susan Nicholson. Present. Jane Azani Pash. Present. Luann Santos. May Neil Perry. Present. And happy to be present. So thank you. All right. Uh, may I have a motion to accept the agenda as presented? So moved. Moved by Member Pesh, seconded by Member Nicholson. Any discussion on the agenda? Hearing and seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. And the ayes carry. Thank you very much. Let's do the flag salute. Do we have a special guest? No. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And by the way, uh, Superintendent, let me say thank you. As somebody who was a personal friend of Gus Blomgren's, I really appreciated your moment of silence. He was a wonderful, wonderful man. My 45 years ago, he was my first head teacher. And he was terrific to work with. He's an asset, so to his sons and his wife, uh, you know, our, our condolences. He's a great, great, great individual and did a lot for Methuen Public Schools, like I said, so thank you. Yeah. Um, has anyone signed up for public participation? No. Nobody. And I see nobody in the audience except that nice young man, and he doesn't look like he wants to do public. Oh, hi, brother. All right, he doesn't want to do. Okay, so at this time, we will close the public participation part of this meeting and move on to item two. Uh, superintendent. Would you please start the presentation on the strategy for district improvement quarterly update, please? Yes, so I'm gonna turn this over to um, Mr. Noble who has a presentation, much like the last three. This is our last um, presentation to, to uh, examine our goals thus far and see where we need to re-establish uh, some goals for next year, uh, recalibrate uh, our work. Um, but we're really excited about the work that we did this year and I hope that shines through in this presentation and also my own goals. Uh, it was a challenging year, but I do think that we uh, had our eye on the prize and accomplished a lot of the things we set out to accomplish and know where our work begins in September. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Noble. Thank you, Dr. Kwong. Good evening, members of the committee. Um, this, this presentation follows a similar format as the one we've used for the previous three updates. Um, just gonna remind everybody what our theory of action is uh, here for the Methuen Public Schools and um, reshare our three objectives, which we shorthand talk about as our literacy goal, our mental health goal, and our equity goal. I'm just gonna go through um, a little bit about each of our three objectives. So you've seen this before, this is our, our headline metric. We had hoped to see 60% of students in grades three through eight reading at or above grade level by the end of this year. Um, and so we can share what data we have at the moment um, that gives you a sense of sort of where we started and where we ended. So our, our most recent MCAS baseline uh, showed that 43% of our students in grades three through eight were at the meeting or exceeding expectations range. And we're still awaiting final spring 2022 data. So we'll have to come back to you in the fall. Um, DESI usually publishes those data in a, in a final format in late August, early September. So we'll have to come back to you to show you sort of where we landed there. But that's the mark we're hoping we hit that 60% mark at. Um, and then our, our internal uh, literacy screening assessment that we've been using all year, we administered a fourth time in the first and second weeks of June. Um, so you'll remember that at the beginning of the year, 24% of our students in grades K through eight were reading at grade level according to that assessment. <clears throat> they had a reading success probability of 70 or higher, which, which meant that if, if they stayed the course, they would be reading at grade level by the end of the school year. That was a 24% of our students fell into that camp. We landed at the end of the school year at 44% um, for K to eight. So not where we want it, um, but certainly you know, moving in the right direction. And this is our first year with this assessment, so we're not sure you know, had we done nothing, we don't know what, what would have happened with those data, but, but this suggests to us that we're doing some things right. Um, that growth is not uh, consistent across all grade levels. So as we've done in the past, we just wanna give you a snapshot of how that looks at each grade level. 
Um, and you're going to see for K1 and 2, the growth that our students demonstrated this year on RAPID is just astronomical. Um, really hard work was done by K through 2 teachers this year to learn a new foundational skills program that really uh, embraces the science of reading, which I'm sure you've all heard a ton about, and that explicit teaching of phonics. Um, so uh, we're excited about the progress we've made there. And, and you know, we started having conversations in some of the buildings about we're handing off our first grade teams, kindergartners who by and large are exceeding grade level expectations. So we got to make sure we capitalize on that momentum uh, as we look into grade one and, and those kids start to progress up through the grades. But we had really strong growth uh, in the early grades. And then you're going to see, you know, less, less growth and no growth as you go up in the middle school grades. And so middle school is going to be an area of focus for us next year. As we look at these data, it's pretty clear we need to support our middle schoolers in different ways than we are doing right now in terms of building literacy skills. Um, this is a chart we've looked at each quarter, so I wanted to share this again. This is, again, honing in on that early literacy linchpin, looking at K to 2 growth. Um, phonological awareness was a huge uh, emphasis this year. This is the, the way letters sounds, uh, the way letters and letter combinations sound, really emphasizing that as a precursor to reading ability. And you're going to see our kiddos in K2 started off the year um, at the 13th percentile and ended the year at the 72nd percentile. That's really strong growth. But across the board, you know, I think we're seeing good things happening in the lower grades. Um, we unpacked these data last quarter, and I did so again this quarter by, by certain subgroup demographics, just to give you a sense of how this initiative and set of strategies is working across different populations of kids. Um, so you're going to see, again, while 44% of our students in K-8 have a reading success probability of 70 or higher, um, that number is only 24% for students with IEPs, 13% of English learners, and 47% of students of color. So you see some places where we're doing quite well with subgroups and other places where we're still lagging. So we have to look into the instructional programs and, and the materials that are being used in those classrooms and make adjustments as needed. So what are our priorities moving forward to the next school year? Um, we're we're going to continue some of the practices we started this year. The regular walkthroughs that Dr. Kwong and I were able to do on a monthly basis, getting into every single building with the building administrative team, with the literacy expert in each building, giving teachers direct feedback on what we were seeing seemed to be very impactful and, and a positive thing. We're going to continue doing that. We're going to continue with the K-8 screening. Right? This year we did it four times a year, reason being we wanted to start next year, next fall, already having baseline data for the kids who are staying with us. We'll have to do some catch-up testing for new students, but next year we'll be able to only do it three times a year because we're starting the fall with, with one piece of data, so we'll be able to move to um, end of trimester testing, so more like a, a November, February, June cadence. Right? Um, K to two, we're going to formally launch foundations as our, fin our, as our foundational skills curriculum. We bought it this year for every K2 classroom. We started training. We just did um, formal launch training uh, last week and had a ton of teachers volunteer some summertime to go through that training so they can hit the ground running. We'll do that again in the fall to get those that we missed and feel really good about launching that formally. Um, K through four, we've started to take Wonders, which is our core ELA program, which is it kind of takes a kitchen sink approach. It just has so many different components and our literacy experts in each building have worked together um, over the spring to say, okay, if we're going to use this program, what are the most essential pieces that we have to make sure every kid gets? And what are the pieces that might be extraneous that we could kind of set aside to give teachers better direction about what's actually important in a program that tries to answer every bell? Um, so we're excited about that. Five and six, um, similarly with those programs, the my, my View and My Perspectives programs, those are our core programs in five and six. Um, we, have, we have similar work ahead with, with those, just making sure teachers know what to really lean on and what to set aside or what, what's the nice to have versus the must have within each program we use. And then 9 through 12, we've talked about the, the Johns Hopkins knowledge map that we got back this year, and those teams are actually working over the summer at the high school to uh, internalize the feedback we got from Johns Hopkins, make some changes to those uh, units of study, and, and make sure that our, our curriculum for 9 through 12 
um, is really representative of our student population and is building that systematic knowledge, background knowledge that we want to see in those classrooms. So that's, that's a summary of, of sort of where we are and where we're heading with literacy. Let me pause there. With the middle school data, um, the eighth graders really made not a whole lot of progress. And now we're throwing them into ninth grade and we're no longer testing them. And I'm a little bit concerned that we're gonna lose knowing whether or not these, we're just losing these kids when they hit ninth grade or not. And so my question is, why aren't we testing them in ninth grade? And what are we doing to support them where we know that a lot of them can't read at grade level. And so now we're throwing them into a curriculum where we're expecting them to read novels on their own and analyze, et cetera, but they're not even at grade level yet. And so how are we managing this and changing the ninth grade curriculum to support the kids coming up that don't have the literacy skills that they should and they're not special ed kids? I appreciate the question. We do have um, a couple of different opportunities at the high school for our struggling readers. And we, it, it's not that we don't screen them at all, it's just that we're not using the rapid assessment to screen them. So um, we do have a reading enhancement block at the high school, um, which uses Reading Plus as its primary platform. And Reading Plus has a, has a similar three times a year assessment called Insight. So students get screened through Insight. Um, you know, they see if they qualify for reading enhancement, they get that support for a particular dosage of a semester or uh, two semesters, and then they screen again and see how, how they're doing. So we have that in place. We also have Academic Support Lab, which is an opportunity. It's a quarter-based course that if the, if the English teacher sees that the student's struggling with some of the basic literacy skills, they can duly enroll a child in the core course so they're not falling behind, and academic support lab so they can get that ad additional remediation and specialized support around the basic literacy skills to catch them back up. And the idea there is that they wouldn't need that forever. They would need that just to get back up to grade level, and then they'd be able to continue on without that support in their in their core course. So we do, we do use assessment data at the high school. Um, the high school team piloted RAPID this year one time. So if you remember um, the winter update that I provided had nine through 12 data represented in it as well. Um, and you know, I think you know, if money were no object, maybe we would bring RAPID up to the high school, but um, we do have some pieces in place to make sure we're not missing um, students to your point. Can I just make one more comment? So the other conversation that Mr. Noble and I are talking about with the principals is five through eight, uh, there's a question about apathy, right? Test taking apathy and are we actually assessing what we want to assess with the older kids, right? So, so there's a little bit of that. So, so for me, I don't know if I want to unilaterally say kids are not reading at grade level. Uh, I don't know we have to look at the assessment to see if it's the right assessment for the grade level, right? The sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, clearly something else is going on. Seventh and eighth grade, remarkably, something else is going on. Uh, but at the same time, we go into our walkthroughs and in seventh and eighth grade, we're seeing teaching and learning happening the way we want to see it. So, um, you know, we're trying to figure out this might not be a one size fits all. Uh, and and how, what does that look like next year with the kids walking in? Because we don't believe they're walking in not reading uh, at the at the numbers that we're seeing, right? And the the elementary level kids typically are uh, well more uh, well well uh, prepared to want to please, right? And and take those kind of assessments more seriously. Um, so we're trying to weigh that out as well and see if that's part of what we're seeing. Uh, and do we need a little more, uh, you know, one-to-one -one FaceTime assessment with middle school kids so they can't hide behind the computer and hide behind a computer-based assessment, you know, with 25 kids in the room and they're done. Um, so, so we're just, you know, and that happens with MCAS as well. There's a, there's a level of apathy that our students have when it comes to test taking uh, and that doesn't stop at just these assessments, right? If it, they're not getting a grade, it doesn't count. It's really hard to bring in that intrinsic value. Um, so those are also conversations we're having. Is it the right fit, right? Is it the right kind of assessment for what we're trying to measure in the upper school? So just that's, I, I feel like we've talked about that a lot more in the past because something's going on and we're all not quite making sense. It's not all making sense to us which is important because we learned something from this and it's, it's, it's certainly putting a spotlight on some of the things that we need to have those conversations about. Yeah. 
Thank you. So I feel like I'm just going to echo my sentiments from the last time we were presented this data. Um, you know, I, I get it, and I, I don't want to discount the hard work that's being done, but I also don't want to sugarcoat these numbers. Um, you know, I see the amazing percent increases in kindergarten, second, first, um, uh, even, you know, third, I think up through third. Fifth, yeah. But you're looking at such low numbers to begin with. And at the end result, even in second grade and first grade almost, we only have a third of our students reading at or above grade level. Um, I mean, that's not okay. I don't think you guys think it is. I'm not suggesting that. Um, and Member Keegan was really nice. Eighth grade, not only did they not improve, but they started at the highest at 54%, and then they had an 11% decrease. Um, so I'm having a hard time with these numbers, um, especially where in the lower grades, I'm assuming that a kindergarten reading, a kindergartner, which I have, you know, reading at or above grade level is basically like sight words. I mean, we're not asking them to read, you know, Moby Dick. Okay. So the percentage should always be large there because you're probably going from a lot of students who can't read to students now who are identifying words, right? So there's going to be a lot of movement there anyway. Um, I just, I'm just concerned. I don't know what to do. You know, I'm thinking back. Um, do we have, I know at the CGS, uh, at least before COVID, they had like reading incentive, like um, book, you know, you had the book club or whatever it was. You could read so many books and you, you know, sometimes they did a trip to Canopy. Right. And I know COVID put a, a, an end to a lot of that. But I would love to see something like that uniformly, you know, done through all the schools, um, these kids have to read. And I'm not suggesting that it's just Methuen because it's not. Kids don't want to read. I loved reading as a child. And they just they just don't, right? The most reading they do is probably on video games and, and whatever we force them to do. And it's too bad because as they move forward into high school, into college, into their careers, reading and, and reading comprehension is probably the most useful tool that you can have going forward. Um, and again, I know as a district we understand that, but we just need to make sure, and it sounds like you guys are doing it, but to make sure that these teachers have whatever resources they need to keep bringing these numbers up. I mean, we set the goal of 60%, so I have to think that when we set that, you guys didn't think that was like completely out of reach. A am I wrong? We thought it was ambitious, but we <laughs> It's hard to say that you're okay having 40% of kids in the district not read at grade level. Right, right? because That's if we lower that, now you're shooting for a half and half. Correct. That's you exactly know, right. So it's ambitious, but we're looking, we're being realistic with the numbers that were presented to us, right? Yeah. So we're, we're left in this sort of like really gray, messy area with MCAS, and we still are, because we don't know what this year's numbers are gonna look like, because they didn't, they didn't adapt. They wanted right. us to adapt, right? because of the pandemic, but the state didn't adapt. So nothing changed on the test. So, so while we are doing what we need to do with two years of a pandemic, the assessments aren't changing, right? So, so we're not quite sure what to expect from those results. Um, so we're in this kind of funky area, I think, with MCAS, and our goal, too, is to calibrate, uh, you know, the rapid assessment assesses very specific literacy skills, and the MCAS assesses very specific reading comprehension skills, right? So, so we want to see how we can calibrate those two because if we're way off, right, if our Alexia data says one thing mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden the MCAS data says Something, another, where do, we where do we calibrate what part of the Alexia sort of matches or, or you know, aligns the best with what MCAS is assessing, right? Because all this work is to build a foundation that kids need to be a better reader for comprehension and for learning. Right? When you get to the MCAS, by the time you're in third grade, they expect you to know how to do all that. Right. Right? So, so it, you know, we're looking at two different things while we're looking at these assessments, which we think is the best approach because we need both of those things to be solid. Um, so it's just, it's an interesting place for us to be in. And yes, it was absolutely ambitious. Uh, I know when I said 60 to my team, uh, Mr. Noble and some others, they looked at me uh, a little like, are you sure? 
Um, but it, it is, that's it, right? Like we need to be ambitious and I, it's not okay for us to say that we're okay with a third of our kids reading. We're not, and we, we are focused on this and we are having conversations and we are getting support materials for teachers. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've said to our staff, our parents, right? Our kids are, do not get a do-over. They do not get a do-over. They get one chance in grade two and that's it. Right, so we need to give them everything, everything we've got, right, to get them the best experience in grade two to get them where they need to get. That's it, they have one shot at grade two. They have one shot at grade five, right? And I, I, I'm trying to impress upon all, all parties, parents included, right? This has been pretty inclusive of parents, uh, but there is a level of apathy. There's a level of apathy with our students and our families and uh, not our teachers, but you know, just the, the what is the most important. And this year has been the biggest struggle with that, mm -hmm. right? What is the most important? Is it the fact that our kids are reading and testing and you know, doing all the work? Is it the fact that they're socializing again and readjust readjusting to routines and schedules and not wearing masks, wearing masks, right? All of those things played into sort of everything that culminated this year. But um, yeah, so it was ambitious. That was a long story, but it was ambitious and we know that, but it was important to be ambitious. And, and I think we need to stay ambitious yep. because again, I'm, I'm probably wouldn't approve a goal. The, the goal, you know, if that were to be 50% of our students no, reading. You can't. To me, that's, that's not a goal, right? right? A, a goal for me is like 80%, having that 20% understanding that those students might, you know, have other um, factors they're not allowing them to to read at or above um, grade level. Do we have, and I feel like I might have seen it, but do we have state average information too? Do we have that? Do we have access to that through DESE or? So for I don't for only MCAS? Have MCAS. For, for, well, MCAS, or do we have other school information? What their students are, like that, like the same information <laughs> statewide, basically? No. I, don't, I didn't we don't know have if Desi ever runs level. anything like that. Or yeah, we wouldn't have any have comparative it. to what we did with our rapid other than maybe communicating with other districts that did rapid. It wouldn't be in any formal way. So it would just way. be the MCAS with the state average. It's just the, the MCAS is the only state assessment that we would have that would be comparable. The, ra the rapid uses a national norm to establish the criteria for meeting that are the reading yeah. success probability. So you have a sense of how your kids stack up against kids across the country using rapid. But the type of comparison that I think you're looking for or would want, I don't, I don't think we have don't it. Have access to. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Maya. Um, I appreciate uh, the question that school committee member. Um, Keegan, I didn't want to use your first name. I apologize. <laughs> That's all I was thinking of was Laurie. I appreciate your question about um, the grade eight students now going into high school and what are we doing to support them and um, Assistant Superintendent Noble, I appreciate your response. I appreciate the apathy piece, which um, the superintendent um, educated us about. Um, I think some of us thought about that anyway. Um, but as I look at the seventh grade with only a 5% increase, and then I look at the priorities for 20, uh, 20, uh, 22, 23 school year, there is not anything specific in there um, to address particularly uh, grade seven and grade eight. And I don't wanna substitute my judgment for, for anyone on the admin team, but I'm, I'm wondering if it makes sense to think about uh, some specific priorities uh, for grade seven and eight. And I know the high those grade eight students will be in the high school, but it seems to me that, you know, if anyone was looking at the chart of improvement and then you turn the page and you look at the priorities, a good question would be, well, are you not thinking about grade seven and eight? So uh, I, would, I would ask um, that um, the leadership team think about uh, some specific priorities for, for particularly those two grades with the scores um, as they are. Member Nicholson, I, I apologize. That is my oversight. I thought I had a bullet in there, but let me describe what the bullet should read for seven and eight, because we do have a plan. <laughs> so. 
Um, I'm so sorry. Thank you for pointing that out. We we are we're partnering with TNTP. Um, you may have heard of TNTP. Um, they're they're a large education publishing house, um, and they have consultants working with our school-based literacy support uh, li literacy supervisors specifically on the grade seven and eight curriculum. So we have this strange progression where we have my view for grade five, my perspectives for grade six, and then we go to a homegrown set of curriculum units for seventh and eighth. And then when the kids get to the high school, they, they have courses that again use my perspectives. So we have this two year gap where we don't have sort of a core foundational program that, that our teachers have access to. Um, they have these homegrown units and the units um, Johns Hopkins reviewed and found them to be very high quality in terms of the, the type and breadth of text that students are exposed to. But what those units don't have is any pedagogical supports for the teachers. It doesn't show what's the essential question you might introduce. How do you structure a lesson around these texts? What are some writing prompts students should be re able to respond to? And what do the rubrics look like that you would grade those, those writing samples with? So TNTP is working with us starting over the summer on the first two units, and then we'll continue to work with us throughout next year to add that meat to the bone of our, of our strong start of, of curriculum to give it actual teeth and, and stronger support for teachers to know, you know how to use those texts in an effective way in, in an effective literacy classroom. So we do have that work underway and I, I thought maybe I accidentally deleted it, but I don't see the bullet here that, you, that we needed to see. So hopefully that puts some of your concern to rest. that table, but I guess I want to make sure I'm thinking correctly. So I would see this more as a multi-year approach, right? So would, would it suggest that the 44% of kindergartners with RSPs greater than or equal to 70%, does that translate, oh, sorry, I'll close that for the mic. Does that translate into um, this coming year, September the first grade, that 44% would be, I would like to see this chart multi-year so that we could kind of see the comparative growth over time. We need to track those kids. I, I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. And that's like, just to give you an anecdote. So we have a team, a kindergarten team in this district that started the year with these single digit percentiles for RSP over seven and ended the year, there are 13 kids in a grade level of over 100 reading below grade level in kindergarten. So we had those kindergarten teachers actually meet with the first grade teacher team to say, you're getting a, a crew of rock stars. Right. Let's not squander this opportunity. These kids do not need the first five, six, seven weeks of instruction that you normally do. Don't do it. They don't need it. Right. They're already reading, right. right? So we have to, uh, you're absolutely right. This has to be a long-term thing. And, and my expectation is that if we're ending the year with 44% of our kindergartners, where they need to be. That means we should be starting next year with 44% of our first graders Correct. where they need to be. And we, should, we, should, we shouldn't be at nine like we were this year. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Okay, so it is our intent to project that? Yes, longitudinally. Any other questions? I have, I have one. Going into the summer and knowing that there's usually that summer slide what, if anything, was put into place to try and encourage kids to continue to be active readers over the summer? I mean, I've made it well known. I don't have kids in the public district. I know what their summer work is required. What is it for the public school kids, especially at this, this age group? So we partner with the Nevitz Library to um, vet our summer reading lists and our summer reading assignments. Um, all the books are available at the library's designated shelves the kids can go to. So if you can't afford to purchase the books or don't want to purchase them, there's a place where you can go and get um, all the selections. We tried to create you know, a really rich um, set of options for families. And to Member Pesh's point, they're running an incentive program out of Nevin so kids can collect. Um, they do little beads for however many books you read and then uh, raffle tickets. Um, th do they still do it? Do they still do it? Wow. 
Um, so we have that program going through Nevins, and then we're also running in every building, we're running um, acceleration academies in the first two weeks of August. And the, the idea behind those is it's a week-long intensive, kind of like a catch-up. So if we look at a, a kid who's entering third grade, what are all the non-negotiable second grade literacy skills, we're also running them for math, that, that they will need to be successful when they get to third grade. Um, so every school has multiple academies running across the K-8 grades for the incoming kids who have been identified as most in jeopardy of, of suffering from that summer slide like you talked about, Member Banks. I just have one other question. Anticipating that slide and hoping that these numbers don't regress terribly, would it be worth exploring doing that September assessment to account for any slides so then you have a baseline of what that slide could look like? Yeah, we've gone back and forth on that and, and um, landed this year with doing the June assessment so that we could close out the year and see where kids went and then, and then be able to hit the ground running with our groupings and, and making sure all that stuff is in place right away. This year, because we did it, the assessment in September, we had this lag where it was two or three weeks into the school year before we could start giving kids exactly what they needed because it took that long to get the assessment program up and running. I see the argument both ways. Um, we chose this, this year, this coming school year, to do the June work, and we're going to see how that plays out. But I, I hear the point, and, and you could argue it both ways, I think. One, um, going forward, based on what the mayor said, could you change this chart from saying kindergarten, first, second, third, to the graduation years so that sure. we can follow that data going forward? Yes. And that way we'll be able to see the kids' growth. Um, that would be super useful going forward. Um, my second question statement um, thought is that if you're changing how you're assessing the kids in grade nine with a totally different assessment, we now have apples and oranges, and now we don't know if there's been any growth or not any growth because you've now changed the assessment so we can't compare. And so I'm concerned that we have separate testing methods for the groups of kids as they move into a different school um, because we now lose all of the valuable data that we had on the kids because now we're not able to use it anymore based on the new assessment. Um, and my last comment thought is that I'm also concerned, um, Superintendent, that when we don't like the data, we say, well, it probably isn't the right data or it isn't, um, it's probably not valid because of this, that, and the other thing. So I'm super concerned that if we're going to put our lives in data, then we have to stick by the data regardless and not necessarily come up with for lack of a better word, and this is a poor choice of word, and I admit it, excuses why the data doesn't look good. Um, I really want to see, you know, this is our data, this is what we're standing by, we've decided this is the right tool to test by, and here it is, and now we're tracking the kids. You know, and it's interesting to hear that you have a brand new curriculum for K-2, and look at the, the, the growth you have this other completely different one that you call the kitchen sink approach and look at the data. And so why aren't we looking at, hey, look, we've got this rock star of a program for the younger kids and clearly it's not the same quality as we have for the older kids. We need to change this as opposed to it's the kids' fault because they don't care. And so I'm just concerned about that, that perception that it's, it's the kids don't care, they have apathy, the parents have apathy, but our staff doesn't. And so that really looks like we're blaming families and parents and kids, and I, I really don't want that approach to come across to families. So that certainly wasn't my intent to come across that way. It's definitely part of our conversations about what is happening. We are befuddled by what is happening in the upper school, like I said. Um, we are not throwing out the assessment. You know, we're going to maintain it. We have a we have a three year plan with Rapid. We're going to go forward and do what we need to do. Um, we also use Reading Plus in the five through eight levels as we do at the high school. So that's been in place for years. That was pre COVID. Um, so we use the Insight as well with the upper school kids. Again, it assesses different things, right? So each assessment will assess different things. Um, 
uh, there's a question about are we getting the most authentic assessments that we need? That's the question on the table. You know, and how do we do that at each of the developmental levels to make sure that we are actually knowing what we're talking about and we actually have, again, the, the authentic information we need. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I read with Ian, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Goslin one-on-one, -on -one, I have a much more authentic experience about what his skills are than uh, seeing what a number is on the computer. So we're just, we're trying to use all of those pieces in our conversations, right? That, that all of those things play into uh, this human business that we're in. Um, so I apologize if it came across that way, but that was not my intent to say that it's an excuse or that it's somebody's fault because that those words didn't come out of my mouth. No, they didn't um, come out of your mouth, but it was like, well, the parents have apathy and the kids have apathy, but my staff doesn't. And so yeah. it really felt like you were kind of putting the blame on everyone else except the staff, and I don't think there's any blame to go around. Yeah, like that's, and um, again, the intent of that conversation wasn't about blame. It was, it was look, being realistic in what we see and what we know about the different developmental groups and age groups. So we are looking at all of those things and having conversations about what's the best approach. We're not throwing anything out. We're sticking with it. We're gonna see what, what comes of it. We know we have work to do in the curriculum uh, world and realm in the seventh and eighth grade. That's definitely, as Mr. Noble said, our eyes on that prize too, that we know that there's a gap there and we have to focus on that. Thank you. I appreciate You're welcome. it. You're welcome. Member Keegan, the, the kitchen sink programs, um, our, our, our theory of action is that they're, or our premise is that they're really high quality programs. They just need curation. We just need to really get in there and say like, this is the good stuff, this stuff's extra. Um, so that's what we're trying to do this coming school year, is just give teachers more direction about how to stick to the good stuff and set aside other things. I think it's a great idea. I think you have a great plan. Thank you. Thanks. You want to move on to objective two? Yes. Thank you. So um, this is our, our mental health objective. Um, we had very detailed headline metrics that, that Mr. Crocker developed for us heading into the school year. Um, and I'll, I'll leave this table up there for a moment. So this is this is our snapshot of progress um, the main takeaway in, in talking to mr. Crocker in preparation for tonight is that you know I think he was surprised all his counseling staff were surprised by just sort of where where students came back to us in terms of their mental health um, so again we had we had baseline data um, from from screening at the end of last year and you can see where we are um, this year and we are not near our goals much like our literacy goal we are falling short of, of that goal um, and again when when mr. Crocker dug under the hood a little bit to, to look at what's going on you know his basic takeaway was you know students entered from a very different place than we anticipated we knew that there would be impact of the pandemic but the magnitude of the impact um, exceeded what we expected so he's got, um, this is our anxiety screening data. There are several slides with data here um, that all tell a very similar picture. There's been a decrease from last year in the prevalence rates of severe moderate um, uh, symptom onset, but um, not to the level that we hoped. And that's across all the metrics that we looked at. So where we're heading, um, we intend to continue offering our group cognitive behavioral therapy groups. Um, we've also partnered with the Beck Institute, which is the, the leading institute that provides training and professional development to educators around CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, to be able to provide staff with additional professional development opportunities to write, right from the source, really. Um, we also are, are planning additional virtual family events to talk about the resources that we can offer, how to access services. Um, we're, we're doing some similar work with students directly, trying to make sure we have literature that they can grab and understand where uh, to go for the support that they might need. Um, next year, we will be fully implementing our social emotional learning curriculum trails to wellness in grades K to four. Um, we rolled that out this past year in grades 
five through 12, and K to four will come on board this coming school year, um, which we're excited about. With Trails to Wellness comes another tool for measuring um, against our headline metrics called Close Gap, which is a, 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 a quick check on students' emotional state where they can offer um, a quick sense of how they're feeling and, and offer um, a request for help from, from teachers or counselors without having to sort of raise their hand and say, I need help. Um, it's just a, a quick click of the button. Um, teachers piloted that this year and learned a heck of a lot about their students um, in terms of how they were uh, um, doing mental health wise and what supports they might need. So we're excited to have that in a more consistent basis. And um, we've also, we talked about this last time, um, we, we dipped our toe into the collaborative problem solving um, world uh, this year by having Stuart Ablon come in and train our five through 12 teachers. Uh, and this summer, uh, he's gonna be working with our leadership team so that all administrators in the district, and, and which includes all folks that are involved in, in uh, discipline matters, are, have a basic framework for collaborative problem solving, know how to approach kids with a new set of tools um, to help uh, prevent the most extreme behaviors that, that we saw this year. Uh, and then we'll be rolling out additional training to staff um, throughout the year on collaborative problem solving as well. We wanna at least enter the school year with a good framework for our administrative staff. So those are the pieces we have in place there. <coughs> Any questions, let me pause there. Thanks, I'm so happy to hear um, what you're going to be implementing. And while these numbers may have not been met, they're actually not as alarming to me as the literacy goals. Um, I think there's so much going on, again, all over that's contributing to these type of factors, factors not only the pandemic, but you know we have other things. Kids have to worry about Alice drills and school shootings, and there's a lot going on. Um, so I, I'm glad that we have something in place. And while I'm not alarmed by it, I also think that numbers like this present challenges when we're trying to implement all the other things with such high levels of anxiety and depression and that sort of stuff. So again, I just wanna give you guys kudos for, for that extra planning. And um, I, I, think, I think, like I said, I think we're gonna need a lot of that going forward because um, there are just there's a lot going on with the world right now. So thanks. I think we should also keep in mind that we're entering into a recession and that is gonna put another strain on families in general. And so while we're doing all of this amazing work in school, these kids are going home to places that may not be as supportive or, or can't be or whatever. And you know, it's really hard to bring some of these numbers down when some of these numbers are representing kids that are coming here for the break, right? And so, um, you know, and I think we, I think it's really important to say that, you know, these numbers are impacting the ability for these kids to access their curriculum and the, our ability to get through to them because they may have homework to do at home, but they can't get it done. And so I think it's amazing what the district as a whole is doing. Um, and I am absolutely thrilled. I will echo my sentiment from last time that we're looking into collaborative problem solving, especially for the administrative teams and the discipline teams. Um, I think it is a huge positive step in the, in the district, and I hope to see some really positive um, changes. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Objective three. Um, so you'll recall our, our objective three goal related is related to educational equity. Um, we actually set a headline metric that will take us through the end of the 23-24 school year because we know this work um, typically takes time to see actual results. But our, our end goal is that historically underserved student groups will be equally likely as other student groups to be higher or lower achieving in grade eight and enrolled in honors and advanced placement courses at the high school level. Um, and this came out of a report that we had uh, commissioned by TNTP last year to sort of set up a, a baseline uh, and give us a, a reasonable goal. Um, so some of the things we did this year in terms of progress, um, we've talked about this, we launched a working group of administrators 
to develop and then ultimately we'll go out for feedback um, on a vision statement for educational equity. So we had our final meeting of that group last week and uh, Superintendent and I have some polishing up to do of that language and, and we will be putting that out for additional feedback and talking about that at our Leadership Institute this summer. Uh, but we think it encapsulates um, you know, all, of, all of the key pillars, which I think I have a slide for, um, of educational equity that should be represented and will give us a really solid foundation to hang all of this work on as we move forward. Um, you know about the, the Johns Hopkins work that we did this year on our seven through 12 English curriculum um, we've also uh, taken an equity lens to our grammar school scheduling. Um, grammar school scheduling has historically not been a centralized process. Each school kind of figures out their own schedule, uh, and a lot of competing priorities drive the schedule. Uh, so this year we, we took a step back collectively and said, well, what, is the, what does the schedule need to serve? Um, and we, we identified academics as the thing it needs to serve. So we can't be building schedules around convenient lunch coverage or you know, uh, adult needs. We have to build schedules around student needs. Um, so what we've done this year across all four grammar schools is, is we establish a schedule that maximizes instructional time for the core subjects and also make sure that any period that's, that's deemed a service delivery period is, is not overlapping as we go through the grade levels, right? So that our limited service providers um, for services like special education and English as a second language um, don't have to compete with one another for when they can access students. There's a clear block for each grade level, which we think is going to dramatically increase the amount of service we can provide without dipping into core instruction. So we're really excited about the, the schedule innovations. Um, we, we did have as well professional development throughout the year on equity, on building anti-racist cultures in schools and classrooms. Um, and we also uh, supported our high school students, who I will say uh, won the statewide award from Generation Citizen again uh, for their civics project. Um, and this year's project was focused on representation uh, in their English and social studies curricula. So we're, we're, we love when we're putting things out and they're coming back to us from the students. Um, and now we have another source of, of real actionable feedback from them about how to make their curriculum more meaningful to them, um, which is the ultimate goal. So we're excited about that work as well. Um, so those are some highlights from year one. Um, these are the pillars that undergird the vision statement that we'll uh, um, come back to you with once we've polished it up for educational equity, looking at all the different pieces of what make a school community um, tick and making sure we're attentive to each of them. Our priorities for the coming school year, we're gonna finalize that vision statement. Um, we're working on that seven through 12 curriculum to be more inclusive and representative. Um, we're exploring collaborative problem solving, which we talked about as well earlier. And uh, we're, working, we're gonna work with the MHS student body to create a more regular feedback loop about their instructional experiences coming out of that civics project work. So let me pause there. Um, I am going to sound like a broken record, and it's going to be my mantra for all the time that I am on the school committee. Subseparates need a step-by-step -step curriculum that teaches them and gives them the chance to take MCAS. There needs to be a solid curriculum going from grade to grade, building to building, that they are able to learn and they learn at their own pace. So if they are able to learn, they can progress in the curriculum. And if they are not able to learn, then they, they go slower and they, they stay where they're at and they just keep working on stuff. But there needs to be curriculum in your sub-separate programs and currently there is not. It seems like we should, we should invite Ms. Bozak to come and, and have that conversation formally at, a, at an upcoming meeting. Yeah, yep. Line, just turn them into <laughs> or board them that way, I hope not. That's it. Thank you. All right, moving on. Uh, Superintendent, would you uh, 
I'd like to start your discussion on your written self-evaluation and the cycle goals, please. Sure. So uh, I'm we're not going to go through all of this tonight. This is really uh, all for you all to have as we go through uh, my ev evaluation cycle so that you have evidence and things to ask questions about. Um, but what I provided for you is an overall summary of the year, which wasn't too different than last year. I had a few other things in there, but um, you know, it was it was uh, challenging in in. Uh, a very similar way to last year, but very for very different reasons. I hope I hope that makes sense. Uh, so it was uh, incredibly stressful. Incre you know, the beginning of the year with focusing on teaching and learning, all the kids coming back, their social emotional, the recalibration of our our everything, right? Our routines, our schedules, um, coming back to school, buses, just everything. Uh, it seems like eons ago, uh, but it wasn't that long ago. Uh, so. I think, uh, you know, I feel very proud of, of the work that we've accomplished to focus on reacclimating our kids back to school and routines and social life and being uh, are the work that we focus on to, to kick off, you know, reading success blocks in the elementary and getting our uh, first year of our strategic plan in place. I think we were more than ambitious to try to do all these things. Many of my colleagues thought I was uh, a little bit crazy to think that all these things could happen, but uh, I do believe, right, we don't get do-overs, so our kids deserve sort of all of this happening all at the same time so that we are focused on their well-being and their academic learning and their growth. Um, and it, as you can see, it's a, it's a long-term work in progress because it doesn't happen overnight. This, we probably should have had year one be our baseline, you know, thinking about uh, all the data that we presented, you know, going off of the data that we've had over the past couple of years has been sporadic at best with MCAS, no MCAS, social emotional, where we were pre-pandemic, we were still working on things, um, you know, but those are all things that we, we are learning and that's why it's a, a working document that we, we do have to revisit every year and think about where our priorities are and how that shifts. So. Uh, that's exactly what our team does, um, so I'm very proud of that. So uh, I think what you have here in front of you are the four goals that were approved in October. Uh, so each section, there's a blue divider. There should be a blue divider for each goal. I have provided uh, evidence to match each one of the action items to give you, um, you know, some idea about how that was accomplished. I certainly didn't give you everything because uh, that would have been enormous but uh, you know f examples of you know what what are our when when Mr. Noble and I went to do walkthroughs of the building what does that feedback look like from principals um, so I gave you some samples of that uh, you know at various times of the year but I certainly didn't put all those emails in here but you know they're all very similar so you can have an idea of what we're looking for what kind of feedback our teachers got um, you know, our monthly meetings, our leadership meetings were very structured and very focused on the strategic plan. So I put an example. Uh, I think for the mid-year cycle, I gave you a blank template. This time I put in a real one of, you know, like sort of how we typed and, and what we talked about and what questions we asked and, and what our focus was. Uh, and we did that every month. So you have an example of, of what that looked like. You know, that's a three hour time frame that we sat with our administrators to really focus on teaching and learning. So. There are different items in here that, that support that work, that drive everything that we've done. So, you know, again, I'm not gonna go through each of the documents, um, but I do feel very strongly that I have met all of my goals based on the action items, uh, which is a very good feeling. Uh, the pieces that are sort of left, you know, a little bit nebulous, which I, I, we're not gonna be able to accomplish in this cycle because of the release of our state data. Uh, is that 60% piece, uh, you know, we won't have that publicly released until September. So that is a little bit of a funky place to be because that was part of my goal is to have that exactly how it was written in the strategic plan. So I recognize that. Uh, so my caveat here was based on the action items. You know, I believe I've met my goal because I've accomplished all those pieces with the leadership team and the work that was, was presented. So, um, you know, ambitious, yes, uh, but we were, we were very focused on getting a lot of this work done, and so I, I feel strongly about that. So, I, so the question is, 
if there are general questions, I would certainly entertain those because I don't think it's prudent for us to go through each one of these. This is for you, uh, information for you to look through as uh, over the summer, this evaluation subcommittee will undoubtedly go through uh, the evaluation and all four standards and my goals uh, and to give you some evidence to provide you some information to help through that process. So I tried to provide, last year I didn't provide quite as much and I think this was, I, I was able to keep a little bit of a better track of this throughout the year myself, um, just to provide a little more and uh, timely so you could see the span from September to, to June, what, what we did and the work that we focused on. So I would certainly entertain questions. I know that there will be uh, potentially, you know, collective questions when I meet with the evaluation subcommittee. Uh, that is uh, typically how we handled it the last couple of years. Um, you know, so I'll just open it to the school committee at this point. You must have done a good job because you stand them in the silence. No. Are you sure? Because now you're making me nervous. I know everybody. You always have some. You know the people who want to say no. It's okay. All right, I got a, I got a question. It's okay. <laughs> I'm gonna come up with one on the spot. It's okay. You did say you were gonna say something, so now you're not. So now you're just making me nervous. No, no I said I wasn't gonna say anything. Okay. But now I'm. Uh, um, I honestly have read through most of this already, um, and I'm really impressed with what you've given us. Um, and you know, I. The first goal I read, and you're like, I feel like I completed this goal, and I'm like, well, that's really good. But then as I'm like looking through all the evidence of it, I'm like, wow, you know, it, it looks really good. So I have to say that I'm impressed with what you've given us, and thank you for that, because it helps evaluate it so much easier. That's hey, all thank I thank you. I think we'll leave the rest of it to be done by the subcommittee, is what it sounds like, yep. right? So Correct. Good job. Okay, moving on. Uh, may I have a motion to approve Superintendent Kwong's 2022 to 2025 contract MOA, changing the due date for self-evaluation and end of cycle goals? So moved. Motion by Member Nicholson, seconded by Member Pesh. Any discussion? Hearing and seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. And the ayes carry it unanimously. Thank you very much. Moving on to the approval of minutes. May I have a motion to approve the minutes of March 28, 2022? So moved. Second. Moved by Member Pesh, seconded by Member Keegan, I believe. Mm. No, nope, Member Banks, sorry. My ears are not good to my right, sorry. Um, any discussion? Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. And the mayor votes present. He wasn't there. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the minutes of April 25th, 2022? So moved. Moved by Member Nicholson in a dead heat with Member Pesh, who seconds the uh, motion. Any discussion? Are you seeing none? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. And the, member once, uh, the mayor once again votes present. Uh, finally, we get to a meeting that I was at. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the minutes of May 9th, 2022? So moved. Moved by Member Keegan. <laughs> no, nope, Member Banks, sorry. Slow to the right. I need a second. Second. Second by Member Nicholson. <laughs> uh, any discussion? <laughs> Hearing and seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And it passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to uh, May 11th. Did I miss my place here? No. no. May 11th. May I have a motion to approve the minutes of May 11th, 2022? So moved. Second. Moved by Member Nicholson, seconded by Member Pesh. Any discussion? Hearing and seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. It passes unanimously with the members present, obviously, right? Without Member Santos and Desaglio. Uh, Moving on to, may I have a motion to approve the minutes of May 23rd, 2022? So moved. Moved by Member Banks. Second. Seconded by Member Keegan. All right, good job, my right wing. All right, uh, any discussion? <laughs> Could be just my ears getting better as the meeting goes on. 
Hearing and seeing none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. And I'll be recorded as present. Present, right? Mm -hmm. And last but not least, may I have a motion to approve the minutes of June 8th, 2022. So moved. Second. Good job. <laughs> Member Banks <laughs> makes the motion, seconded by Member Keegan. Any discussion on those minutes? Hearing and seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. And I'll be recorded as present. Right. Do we have quorum? If, if One, we don't? Two. No, we That's don't. That's only three. No. Right. So, uh, so I'll have to bring that back up at the next, right? Sorry. You should ask first if it's majority of who's here or majority of board. We did. I don't remember the answer. Well, we took the vote. If it is, we'll So we'll just find out. Uh, you gotta have quorum, though. I, th I think you're right. So. Uh, I will ask for a second. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. May I have a motion to approve the transfer of funds from professional salaries, in the amount of fifty-seven thousand dollars, clerical salaries, in the amount of fifty-three thousand dollars, and other expenses, in the amount of twenty-five thousand dollars, to contracted services for a total of one hundred thirty-five thousand dollars. So moved. Moved by Member Keegan. Yes. Seconded by Member Nicholson. Right and lefty is both working well. <laughs> so, any discussion on this transfer? Hearing and seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Carries unanimously. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the transfer of funds from non net crossing guards, other salaries in the amount of $29,811, and non net crossing guards supplies in the amount of $1,000? to non-net contracted services transportation for a total of $30,811. Moved by Member Nicholson. Second. Seconded by Member Banks. Is okay that time. Any discussion? Just a quick question. Is yeah. this something that we budget, like the crossing guards, we must know if it's hourly, like I'm assuming they're paid hourly? Correct. Is there a reason that we came in? We couldn't find people uh, to actually okay. be crossing guards. Fair enough. Yeah. That we had we had struggled we struggled to staff those positions. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Carries unanimously. Are we going to talk about the other transfers, or is that not coming up in the meeting? Which other transfers? Uh, the ones that were in the package. The one the request to move funds in order to close out FY22. That's the next one. Um, the, next request. the next request. I have a motion to give the superintendent authority to transfer funds in order to close out FY22. So moved. Second. Motion by Member Keegan, seconded by Member Nicholson. What's the Discussion. change on here? Uh, What's the change on here? There was typo on the dates. Yeah. Uh, okay, because I'm looking at the numbers. Yeah. There were typos on the dates. So I, I have one question for you. Sure. So um, I'm not against most of it. So the supplies is like a, a yeah. red hot button. And so I, I, here we are at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. We've got $235,000 extra in supplies from budget, Kay. right? Why are we not just distributing that to the schools and telling the teachers, have at, get the things that you need? We're struggling to get product. So um, usually what we do is we buy a whole bunch of, we get copy paper, yeah. stuff we know that we're going to absolutely need. Um, we can't get it. So we find, we find ourselves closing POs because we can't get the stuff that we had ordered. So, so that number was actually lower. Yeah. And as we get closer to the end of the year, we try to close out POs and make sure we pay all our invoices. And we're finding that we can't even get the product. Um, as you know, we, we ordered vehicles, you know, capital improvement, they said 30 weeks. And I think we're at 50 weeks and they haven't started manufacturing them. We need a city council as a show and tell. Yeah. It, it's it, it's unbelievable. So that's that's part of the struggle right now. Well, and copy paper is not going to get better. It's going to get worse. Correct. And and the price is. Oh yeah. The price is. Way up. So okay. Any other questions? Any thoughts? Okay. So uh, one point of clarification. So we just talking about the the ones that were in the package. Are we talking about carte blanche? 
the way this is written here. Yep. So we have a we have a big payroll that's going out Thursday. Yep. So we're not on the on the very last day of the year. Of course, makes it a little. So once that hits, yep. um, I'll have to clean it all up for anybody who got extra pay or we docked pay or. So there will be some additional funds. At that point, I'll have to do an opine, um, which Sean referenced in his opine, um, that well, I'll have to clean up all the accounts. And my intent, which is in there, is to move all the funds into contracted services, and at which point do a journal entry leaving all the funds in circuit breaker. And I anticipate having between 3.7 and $3.8 million in circuit breaker for, for use next year. And, and as you know, I'm not against the circuit breaker. Yep. But I guess, and I want to say this has nothing to do with mm -hmm. the superintendent, I trust, but based on our city's history, I would much rather after the payroll closeout do a Zoom meeting with the school committee to kind of go through the transfers personally. Because otherwise, we're you know, setting the bluebirds up for. You know, um, well, for the last two years, we. Um, we did this. I do send the opine out, and I send it to you guys. I send it to you guys as well before the transfers happen. I voted against it both years. Yep, which is fine. Which is. Do it a third year. <laughs> I think we did a not to exceed though, didn't we? Those two years, or am I making that up? I think we, did. we put um, some contingency oh. on it because I, I have to agree with the mayor. I, in terms I of believe. Office, I so believe it was a date. I believe uh, um, up until June fifteenth. I'm uh, sorry, July fifteenth. I believe is what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Which is when our books have to be closed by, anyways. But it's not to exceed that. It, we're looking at the 1.4. Is that what we're looking at? How much are we expecting to be moving around? As soon as payroll hits, so I'll know exactly. I, I don't want to give you a number and mislead you. Okay. Um, I believe this is a conservative number right now. Yep. Well, the 1.4 is yep. fine, actually. Sorry, I misread oh. that. Any other questions from any of the members of the committee? Okay. Let's do a roll call vote on this. Rachel Banks? Yes. Ryan Gisaglio? Laurie Keegan? Yes. Susan Nicholson? Yes. Jane Azani Pesh? No. Lewin Santos? May and Neil Perry? No. I think the motion carries. Thank you. Check that. So, because <clears throat> I don't think it requires a super majority, but let's check that. Yep. Right? Second. Both okay. Of those votes. Moving yep. on, is there any other business from the committee? I have a note here, and I missed the meeting, and I want to apologize. Uh, nominations were accepted and a vote taken at the June 8th meeting for volunteers for the Superintendent Evaluation Subcommittee. If there are to be any changes to the nominees, we will need to take a new vote. So I wanted to open that up for discussion. Um, uh, who were the members who were nominated? I, I should have picked that up. And Member Nichols, right? Yes, w with the understanding that um, you were not here and um, yeah. Member Pesh was not here, and I've done this a number of times, yeah. and I wanted to afford you, both of you, the opportunity to volunteer. Yeah. But, but, but I, and, and I'm hoping that that, that will happen. Yep. Um, so. It will. So I can tell you that it will. So I'm happy okay. to, if Member Pesh is too busy, I'm happy to. Uh, step on the subcommittee. Uh, I think that's wonderful, um, and and we need to build the capacity of this yep. committee to do this evaluation. And we attempted to do that last year, and then one member had some uh, issues with with uh, um, with where she was living and could not participate. Yep. And so, um, uh, school, former school committee member Cameron Hallbauer and I did it. In hindsight, I wished I had come back to the committee and, and asked for a volunteer because we do need to build a capacity for everyone to, to understand the evaluation tool. And I've done it for years, and even doing it for years, I still refer to notes because you're doing it just once a year and there's, there's an opportunity to be forgetful. Yep. Um, and, and so I, I, I worry about the fidelity of, of, of delivering the superintendent's evaluation because it's it's huge and she can tell you that every year we've met with her with with questions with clarifications uh, but this is this is awesome what what you've done here um, I haven't gotten through everything but I've gotten through maybe three-fourths of it and um, and it's great 
Um, and so I would, I, I'm pleased that the mayor is, is interested. I don't need to be on the committee. I really didn't want that time commitment. Um, but with well, that, we might need your tutelage a little bit. But with that being said, I would make myself available uh, to meet, especially with our two new members, with, with an overview um, of of the process. If you need that, um, or or anything else that you might need, I'm I'm happy to meet with you, um, and and give you, you know, my sense of the work that has been going on since we got that evaluation document from the Department of Ed. So I, I put that out there. Appreciate that. Yeah. So are you interested? Um, I've done it on the past a couple times. I think both times with Member Nicholson. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's a nice opportunity and I agree with the pack. I th actually think this is one of the more comprehensive. I think I'm getting the hang of this now. Yeah. <laughs> I think well, that's even what's happening. Emails, like I don't remember ever seeing that before. So yeah. it's, it's, it's definitely more comprehensive, so I think you guys will have an easier time. Um, when they reached out to me, Member Nicholson, I have to say my first impulse was, please, I know it's a big time commitment, but she's actually the best resource. Having been a superintendent to have on it, so you were kind of my resource in doing it. Um, but um, I, I would prefer not to do that time commitment this year, but I actually would would say too, if something happens and you guys feel yourself needing the extra help, I too would make myself available. I don't think it, anybody should be, you know, strapped with that amount of work if, if something happens. Okay. Unforeseeable. So where I'm uh, a new volunteer, I will need a motion to accept the new superintendent evaluation subcommittee members. Which would consist so moved. Of oh. Myself, Member Keegan and Member Bank, right? With coaching and tutelage from <laughs> <laughs> I don't charge much either. <laughs> yeah. Need a motion? So moved. moved by Second. Member Pesch, seconded by Member Nicholson. Any discussion on that? You can see none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. We also need to appoint the chair to the subcommittee at this point. So I would offer that to one of you two members if you'd like. So I think Member Banks and I just voted for Member Keegan as the, the chair. Um, so congratulations, you've been appointed the chair. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, moving on with an upward. Thank you, ladies. That was a good discussion. Um, uh, I, I need a motion and a second to enter into executive session. But no vote yet. So I need a motion. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second to enter into executive session. Motion by Member Pesch, seconded by Member Nicholson. Executive session pursuant to Mass General Law, Chapter 38, Section 21A4, to discuss the deployment of security personnel devices or strategies with respect thereto. We will not reconvene into an open session at the conclusion of the executive session. Our roll call vote, if we can, please. Rachel Dang. Yes. Ryan DeZaglio, Lori Keegan. Yes. Susan Nicholson. Yes. Jane Azani Pesh. Yes. Luann Santos, May and Neil Perry. Yes. Uh, thank you all. So the time is now 6.15 and the meeting is adjourned. Uh, oh, actually I need a motion to adjourn. I apologize, I'm getting slippery in my own. I'm forgetful, Sue, right? I've been away for a while. So I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved by Member Nicholson, seconded by Member Pesh. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. The meeting is adjourned at 6.16 6 p.m. Um, and we will not reconvene into open session at the conclusion of the executive session. Thank you all very much.